The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, welcome everybody to Ron Book Show on this Wednesday. Uh, no, it's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. I'm skipping ahead of day. On this Tuesday evening, um, yes, video is good today. Uh, bandwidth is back in uh, in my condo in Puerto Rico. Uh, yesterday we were running on literally fumes. There was no bandwidth, zero zilch, nothing. Um, today we're back to full speed. We've got, I don't know, 200 uh, megabytes uh, per second up, upstream, so we should be good. Still could be tons of technical errors, but at least we know the bandwidth is good. All right. So uh, thanks, thanks everybody for joining me three days in a row. I know you're probably getting a little tired of me, but I, I do promise I, I'm leaving. I'm going on the road uh, tomorrow, so I won't be around for... A couple of weeks, so you can take a little bit of a rest from uh, live shows, uh, live shows with me. Uh, but uh, I thought today we'd shift to an economic topic, uh, a topic that's related to uh, to the uh, state of economics in the world. I, I read an article in the Economist magazine. Um, you know, I, I get I get the Economist emails from the Economist on a regular basis, and the title of this article struck me in. And then reading it uh, made me so frustrated that I figured I would share my frustration with you guys. Um, the title is Economists Cannot Agree on What Ails the Global Economy. And, and this is true. Economists, indeed, cannot agree on what ails the global economy. Uh, they, they are, uh, they are, you know, the huge disagreement, huge um, I think ignorance and, and silliness and stupidity among economists and, and a lack of integration. We talked about integration yesterday, a lack of integration of the theory and the data and, and, uh, and what is going on. So I thought I'd go over some of the arguments. The funny thing is, according to article at least, the economists agree on the solution. They, they don't agree on the cause, but they agree on the solution. We'll, we'll get to that. Everybody agrees on the solution. Uh, we will get uh, we will get to that the solution for uh, slow economic growth. But first, the, the, the problem the, the the challenge is that the global economy, particularly the global economy in developed economies, and and when I talk here about Western economies, I'm basically talking about uh, developed economies. So I, I'm not only including uh, the West geographically, but the West spiritually and and culturally. So I include Japan, for example. Uh, economically, it is a part of the West. I include the Asian tigers, um, uh, so South Korea and, and Hong Kong and Singapore. And what is, what is true of all these economies, from the United States to, to Europe to these, uh, these countries in Asia, is that the economies of all these countries have basically slowed down dramatically. The United States maybe has the fastest growing economy among them, and it's only growing at like 2 point something percent. 2.2 percent was the latest number, and uh, it might go below two. I mean, that is pathetic growth. If we had had uh, 2 percent growth from the uh, turn of the 19th century and the 20th century until today, we'd be poorer than Mexico. So growth matters. Every, every fraction of a percentage of a point matters when it comes to economic growth. So uh, for developed economies to only grow at around 2% is, is really, really, really bad. Now, what's interesting is even the, the developing economies have relatively slowed. Um, and uh, I'd say that the, uh, you know, China's a good example. It's slowed to around 6%, probably a lot less than that from 10, 12, 15%. Even India has slowed. Much of the developing world has slowed. So generally, there seems to be a slowdown in economic growth in the world. And this has massive consequences. Massive consequences to alleviation of poverty. Massive consequences to the opportunities that individuals face 
in the United States, it has, uh, and in Europe, it has consequences to uh, economic mobility. It has consequences to the ability of a younger generation uh, to become wealthy and to become successful. And, and it has consequences for all of us in the sense that we're just getting richer at a much, much slower rate. Wages are not going up very fast, although it's interesting if you look at the wage numbers. While wage numbers on average are not going very, up very fast, they, they're going up faster for, for, for low-wage employees and, and slower for high-wage employees and all kinds of technical reasons for that and, and real reasons for that. But generally, wages are just not going up very fast. And this is all in an environment with zero interest rates and negative interest rates in some places. So things, things, are, things should be set up for massive amounts of growth with, with low interest rates. Low interest rates means it's, it's cheap to make investments. It's easy to make investments. It's so, well, it's cheap to borrow money, put it that way. And therefore, that money should be going to invest in new production, which uh, in increased productivity, and therefore in growing an economy. So why isn't it happening? And why, as a consequence, if you will, interest rates are stuck at such a low level? So here's what economists are thinking. Economists, uh, so the reason uh, the story came out and, you know, yesterday's show about uh, suicide and opioids and so on was also a result of the fact that uh, a bunch of articles came out because of the recent American Economics Association meetings. These are annual meetings uh, of all the of economists. Um, and they have sessions, talks, panels, discussions, interviews for jobs. It's massive, thousands of economists. Uh, I don't know where it was held this year, but it's every year it's at a massive, um, you know, one of these convention centers. And it was, it's always held, or, or in recent years, it's been held in the first week in January. So you get a lot of information coming out of that. And so there are two schools of thought, supposedly, according to this article. Two schools of thought. Um, uh, around the issue of, uh, of economic growth and why we're getting such low economic growth. Um, there's the supply side and the demand side. The supply side is the producer side, the, the side that produces stuff, that creates stuff, that builds stuff, that invests, that is investment. And some blame supply and some blame demand for the la and demand side is consumption. It's buying stuff. It's 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 I want more. I want more. I want more, and therefore more is produced. And if I stop wanting more, then less is produced, and and the economy slows down. That is those are the two slide sides, right? So let's start with the supply siders. The supply side is argue that the demand, the demand, particularly in the U.S. economy, is robust. Consumers are spending money. We have a strong labor market. People have money, and they seem to be spending it. The problem is not demand. The problem, they argue, is supply, our ability to produce more stuff. Ability to produce more stuff. So while demand is there, producers just can't produce enough stuff to generate, to, 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 to match the demand. Now, why is this? Why can't producers produce as much? Well, production goes up based on two parameters. Either you have more people, that is, more labor, more people actually working, or the people who are working have to become more productive. And ideally, both happen. So Upton asks, did immigration help economic growth in the 1800s? Well, of course it did, massively, right? Because what immigration supplied is more people. Therefore, more hands that can produce more supply, more stuff for people to have. Now, it wasn't just immigration. It was also high birth rates, so growing population. And it was, more importantly, massive increases in productivity driven by technological innovation. 
So the drivers of production are increased productivity, i.e. innovation, or and more people, more, more people doing stuff, more people working. So reducing immigration, all else held constant, reduces production. Reduction in birth rates, all else held constant, reduces long-term production. <clears throat> Reductions in the population, in other words, reduces production. Also, uh, you know, retirement, increased, increased death, um, uh, people exiting the workplace like they are in the United States with the baby boomers retiring, all else constant reduces the amount being produced. Right? So the supply side is saying, look, because of restraints on immigration, because of lower birth rates, because of an aging population, we are seeing a reduction in the number of people to produce. And at the same time, at the same time, we're actually seeing a slowdown in technological innovation. There is just not enough technological innovation to drive economic growth. Right? So, you know, to quote the article, there are only two ways to boost potential growth, increase the number of workers or improve workers' capacity for production through technological advances. While unemployment is low, the labor force participation rate has been declining, primarily because of retirement. The burden for boosting productivity and potential growth therefore falls mainly on technological innovation. Trend growth is weak, supply advocates say, because low productivity growth keeps companies from being able to supply enough goods and services. And the question, of course, is why is productivity growth slow? Why is it low? What is holding it back? We'll get to that. Right. So that's the supply, guys. Productivity is low. That's why we don't see economic growth. No, no, say the people on the demand side. That's not the problem. This is more the Keynesian side, if you will. They say the problem is that we've entered a period of what's called secular stagnation. That is, that we've got an aging population. That is true. But we've also got rising inequality. Not sure exactly how that impacts anything. And what these two things, the aging population and the rising inequality have done, is they've caused everybody to save more. So people are saving way too much, from an economic perspective, money. Indeed, they're saving more than there are investment opportunities. And in that sense, they are hoarding. That is, there's more investment, there's more saving than can be invested. Now, what this does is it pushes down interest rates. And it makes it very difficult for central banks to encourage consumption. But the problem is that people are not consuming enough because they're worried about retirement, because they're worried about inequality. And as a consequence... They're saving much, and of course the problem of inequality is that rich people don't consume. Rich people save. There's only so many yachts you can buy. There's only so many mansions you can have. There are only so many private planes you can have. If you're a billionaire, you're basically a saver. You consume a fraction of your income or your wealth. So the problem today is too much saving. And there's so much saving, and there's so little demand for saving, investment, that interest rates are at historic lows, or dramatically low. So the, these demand people are claiming there is a saving glut and a shortage of consumption, a shortage in demand, right? So um, let's see, uh, to today, they say if the labor markets were near full employment and supporting consumption, wage pressure would mount. 
but wages are not going up, although they are, but not as fast as they would like. There's no demand for new investment, they say. If there was demand for new investment, we would see saving flow into existing capital in the form of, we wouldn't see uh, savings flow into existing capital in the form of share buybacks or higher dividends. So here's the quagmire, right? You've got the demand side saying, no, 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 no. We have too much saving, not enough investment, not enough demand for investment. There are not enough people who want capital in order to invest. And we've got people who are uh, saying, and, 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 as a, and, and as a consequence, the saving is coming at the expense of consumption. On the flip side, we're saying, no, the, the, the problem is that we don't have enough growth in productivity. And we've got basically a stagnant workforce. It's not growing enough. And these two are arguing. Now, both sides, according to the article, agree on potential solutions. Now, can any of you guess what the potential solutions are? Well, more government spending. On the supply side, they say the government could support research and development, science, to improve education and skills, so they could invest more in education, and skills training, to boost productivity growth. Right. Public investment could also stimulate aggregate demand by addressing some of the structural drivers of secular stagnation. For example, we could have stronger social insurance would reduce the propensity for people to hoard savings. So if you knew there was a vast safety net, you wouldn't save. You would consume. And of course, government doesn't save when it creates the vast safety net. They borrow in order to do that, right? They don't, they don't, there's no pot of money somewhere with social security in it. It's been spent already. They will borrow in the future to cover expenditure. So it's great. Government will consume and you will consume and nobody will save. We'll just count on future wealth to be taxed away to pay out your social insurance, as they call it. Okay. And they say, look, it doesn't have to be at the expense of a budget deficit, because, you know, budget deficit, some people think, is bad. For example, you could have much more taxes. You could have much higher taxes on the rich, much more progressive taxation. And that much more progressive taxation would reduce inequality which would also reduce people's propensity to save because as the rich got poorer, they, you know, they would have less money to save and the poor people would get that money and they would use it to consume because the fact is that the poor people's propensity to consume is higher than rich people's propensity to consume. So everybody agrees on the solution. More government spending, more government spending on education and science, more government spending on social programs and redistribution of wealth. And that, my friends, will solve the growth problem. But funnily enough, to some extent or another, that's what these economies have been doing for the last 40 years. The United States has the most progressive tax system in the developed world. Maybe, maybe that's why they argue it, it's doing better than the rest of the world, really. Um, Japan has invested massively in infrastructure and education and training and all kinds of stuff in order to increase aggregate demand and to invest in long-term science to, in order to boost long-term productivity. Japan has invested massively in Japan. If you don't know the story of Japan, Japan has seen almost no economic growth since the early 1990s. Right? That's 30 years of almost zero economic growth. That's astounding. And 
that manifests itself in almost no growth in productivity. Now, to me, the whole thing is somewhat comical. Because supply is demand and demand is supply. And, and, and this idea that they're all different, that, that, that the causes here are different, that, that, that there's no connection, that they're not related, that they're not interconnected, is to me ludicrous. The idea that saving is bad somehow, that consumption is good somehow, or saving is better than consumption, or consumption is better than saving. As if the market doesn't have a mechanism to deal with all of that. It's called interest rates, and we'll get to interest rates. But let's start with the supply side, and we'll go to the demand side, and we'll see how it's all connected. It's all the same. It's all one problem. And the cause of the problem is the exact opposite of what they claim. I mean, no, it's, it's not the exact opposite. It is the, 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 what they're claiming, in a sense. But the solution to it is the exact opposite of what they claim. So, oops, sorry. Let's, um, let's look at the supply side. It is true. It's, it's just a fact that we're seeing population stagnate in Europe, in the United States. Japan is the fastest growing fastest shrinking population in the world. South Korea is shrinking. Much of Europe is shrinking. The United States is kind of uh, stable, primarily because immigration and because immigrants have higher birth rates. But overall, population growth is stagnant. And because of restrictions on immigration, and not only restrictions on immigration, restrictions on immigra immigrants' ability to work. So even in Europe, when you had mass immigration. In many of those places, the immigrants were handed checks, but not allowed to work or not allowed to work for a year or three years. In different countries, it's different. So basically, the workforce is stagnant to shrinking because the baby boom generation, which is a worldwide generation, certainly in a developed world generation, is retiring. You've got a shrinking workforce. And it is true that productivity has slowed. So you've got less people working, and productivity has slowed. And the question is why? Why is productivity slowed? Well, to answer that question, you have to ask, or, or why is innovation slowed? Or why has technological progress slowed? And now, it has... It, in some ways, in spite of the internet, in spite of all the technological marvel that's coming out of Silicon Valley, it seems that technology is advancing only in what Peter Thiel calls the electron businesses, in the subatomic particle businesses. But in businesses that actually deal with atoms, with molecules, with stuff we can see, innovation is almost non-existent. And you have to ask the question of why. Why is innovation slowed so dramatically? Why is pro product productivity, therefore, slowed significantly? Why is technological breakthrough slowed? I mean, if you think of the technological breakthroughs at the turn of the century, you think of the Wright brothers, Thomas, Jeff uh, Thomas Edison, so going to electricity, going to oil, going to the internal combustion engine, automobiles, airplanes. I mean, these are massive, massive, life-changing, world-shattering changes to everything. Now, it's true, we have had a computer revolution, and indeed, almost all the productivity gains over the last 40 years are the consequences of computers, of the integration of computers into business, the replacement of employees with machines, with algorithms, with robots, with everything. So whatever productivity gain we have seen, it's come from this one industry. But we're not seeing much innovation elsewhere. We're still using fossil fuels. Now, they're, they're damn good, but what happened to, the, to, to nuclear? What happened to flying cars? What happened to 
mining asteroids? What happened to the massive potential that exists out there in the, in the, in the space of big physical products to improve dramatically beyond just the computing power? Well, again, one has to ask the question, what makes innovation possible? What makes progress possible? And here one has to rely on, on Ayn Rand and, and Austrian economists. What makes innovation possible is the human mind. It's people thinking. It's people exploring. It's people experimenting. It's people trying and failing 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 and then succeeding. Ask Thomas Edison. Ask the Wright brothers. What progress, technological progress, innovation requires is an entrepreneurial mentality, an individualist holds, you know, uh, uh, pushing ahead, taking risks, failing, experimenting, trying, getting up on your feet, going ahead again, trying again, failing. It requires experimentation. It requires the human mind to be free, to think, to innovate, to progress, and it requires the freedom to apply those thoughts in reality. In reality. That is, it requires the freedom, the freedom to build businesses, to fail at businesses, to experiment, to try new things. And the fact is that other than in the Silicon Valley world, and that world is going away in my view, but other than in the technological world, we have no, none of that freedom anymore. I mean, I was just reading that the European Union wants to regulate the, the power connector for phones and devices. They want to make sure that all devices have the, the same connectivity so that you, the consumer, will only have to buy one cable for all your devices. Isn't that wonderful? And they're upset because Apple uses one type of cable and everybody else uses a different type of cable. So they want standardization of cables. I mean, this is how you destroy innovation. You start regulating the minutia. You start regulating every aspect of a business. You tell people when they, what businesses they can start, what they can't start, what things they can experiment in, what they can't. They have to wear goggles, otherwise they, you could go to jail, I guess, or get fined. Imagine if you told Thomas Edison he had to wear goggles and he had to have sprinklers and he had to invest millions of dollars in safety, he would have never done what he did. Or the Wright brothers. Oh, no, no, that's too risky, guys. We live in a culture where the government stifles risk-taking. It stifles innovation. It stifles experimentation. The FDA makes it almost impossible to bring a new drug to market. The innovation in healthcare that would be allowed if you privatized the FDA and you had private, private institutions who regulated for the private sector drugs is unimaginable as compared to what we have today. Now, of course, one of the funny things about the European Union is they're going to regulate which cable you stick in the thing, just as Apple is announcing, we're not going to have any cable, everything is going to go wireless, right? Everything is going to go uh, wireless charging. But, th but that's, regulation would stifle that. They'd say, wait a minute, it has to have a cable. You, you can't produce products without, ca without the ability to charge with a cable. What about all the cables you're on bought and, and, and has? You, know, it's, you can't not offer that option. That's what we're getting to. So it is the regulatory agency. It's the regulatory mentality that is stifling 
economic growth, that is stifling a lack of productivity, that is stifling entrepreneurship. And it's true that we lack an investment in research and development and education. But that's because government has crowded out private investment from these fields. We have no massive investment in education because the government controls education. And our educational system sucks is the technical term. In order to produce entrepreneurs, we have to have people who can think. Not just think by the book, not just think, but think creatively. Think outside of the box. Think independently. And for that, you would need a vastly different educational system than what we have today, which is about what learning, if it's about learning at all, when it's not about socializing. But even Europe's better educational system, I don't know, Finland or whatever, are not producing thinkers not producing innovators, not producing producers, not producing risk takers. Indeed, we've taken risk out of life. Risk is dangerous. <laughs> we don't want people to take risk. And we teach them not to take risk. As parents, we do the same thing. We discourage risk taking. So we have a culture of people who should be the innovators who are afraid to take risk, afraid to fail, I mean, the U.S. is better than Japan in this, better than Europe in this. In, in the U.S., it's still acceptable to fail. In these other countries, it's not. The, the, the dream job of a Frenchman is a government job and as a civil servant with a lifetime income and a lifetime pension and everything. That is an ideal. But that's what needs to be chucked. We need to encourage risk-taking. We don't want a stronger social insurance network. You want people to feel like they are responsible for their own lives. They're responsible for bringing in the money that, that, that we live in a world that is not structured to, 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 to protect you. But one that is structured to allow you to benefit from freedom. Allows you, leaves you alone to produce, to create, to build, to make, free of mother government, paternalistic government sitting on your shoulder telling you what you can and cannot do, what you can and cannot produce, how much you can and cannot pay your, pay your employees. You want increasing productivity. What you need is more freedom, freedom in the school system by privatizing it, allowing for real competition in innovation in schools, freedom in science and research and development by taking the government out of science funding so that entrepreneurs and individuals and corporations and businesses start investing in science, but in science that can be turned into technology, science that can be turned into increasing productivity. Okay, I was talking about the, um, the supply side explanation for why we are in stagnation is because there's not enough increase, there's not enough growth in productivity. And that is absolutely right. But the solution is not more government investment. The solution is not more government control, but less. What we need is to free up, free up businesses, free up entrepreneurs, free people up to be creative. We need to free up the educational system to improve education and change a mentality change our attitude towards risk taking and entrepreneurship. But what about the demand side? What about this idea of too much savings? Now again, there is truth in this idea. There is truth to the idea that right now there's too much saving relative to investment. Indeed, that is why, one reason why, interest rates are so low. That is, there's not enough entrepreneurs. There are not enough good ideas. There are not enough places to deploy money where you can get a good return on your investment. There is not enough places to invest your money 
that are profitable. It's not that there's a glut of saving. It is not enough investment. Now, part of all this, both on the side of productivity, on the side of saving, on the side of investment, on the side of consumption, is the massive distortion that is created by central banks that play with us, play with us, as if we're just puppets. Instead of letting interest rates be determined by supply and demand for saving and investment, interest rates are determined by fiat, by some committee, by a bunch of guys sitting around a desk deciding what the appropriate interest rate would be. And guess what? They obviously keep getting it wrong. Because we've got stagnation. And to a large extent, the stagnation we have is caused by the constant tinkering with the money supply and with interest rates. And it's not just like in the old days where they used to, for the most part, only focus on short-term rates. Today, with quantitative easing, they're buying long-term bonds, mortgage bonds. They're, they're determining interest rates in the mortgage markets and private markets and public markets across the entire board. So we've got this massive distortion of central banking. And you can't, therefore, argue that there's too much saving or too little saving or too much this. Or too there is no such thing as too much saving. There is no such thing as a glut of saving. There's a response to the market. If there was a lot of savings, interest rates could go down, borrowing costs would decrease, demand for borrowing would increase, and interest rates would go up. But the central banks won't let interest rates go up when there's an increase in a demand. So the whole mechanism by which investment gets adjusted, the cost of investment gets deducted, Capital gets allocated across the economy. That mechanism is completely distorted and perverted by central banks. So you want to get back to a robust, growing, vibrant economy. Is you've got to eliminate regulations, get government out of science and education, and importantly, get government out of the business of setting interest rates and determining out of, out of the business of money completely. So that interest rates are determined by supply and demand. Interest rates are determined by how much investment there really is, how much saving people want at any given point in time, at any given interest rate. I mean, interest rates are artificially low across the entire yield curve, across all kinds of bonds, because government has demanded that. Central banks have dictated it. So one can't blame the market or claim that this is a market phenomena when it is so perverted and distorted and the solution cannot be more of the same. More government control of, of education, more government investment in science, more safety net, more manipulation of the currency and of interest rates by the central bank. That is the exact opposite of what needs to happen. So the bottom line is the West is stagnating because economic freedom is stagnating. Developing economies are stagnating because economic freedom is stagnating. Until we get freedom up, government out of the way, we're going to live through slow economic growth. You look at Japan. Japan is a great example of this. Japan is massively regulated, massively controlled by the government. Business 
banking is dictated by the government. And therefore, when it had a big recession, it couldn't get out. It couldn't recover. It couldn't increase productivity. It couldn't realign resources because everything was dictated through central planning. Now, not everything, not in the same way as communism. So there's enough freedom not to completely, you know, collapse into depression, but not enough freedom in order to grow. Growth, again, requires innovation. It requires freedom. It requires thinkers. It requires risk takers. And that's not Japan. Not Japan, not because there's anything wrong with the Japanese, but not Japan because of the level and extent of government intervention. Okay, great. Let me, let me see if there are any questions in the Super Chat. And I did save all the old Super Chat questions, so I have them. Um, let me see. Which founding father had the best economic ideas? I mean, Hamilton had some good economic ideas, and I think some bad ones. Uh, Jefferson had some e good economic ideas, but a lot of bad ones. I, none of the founding fathers were very good in economics. Uh, economics was a very young field. Capitalism had not really fully been born. In a sense, they were birthing it. Um, they had read Adam Smith, but I'm not an expert on the Founding Fathers. Uh, I'm far from an expert on the Founding Fathers. But from my limited knowledge, I don't think any of them was, was a superstar when it comes to, uh, when it comes to um, economics. And, it, and, and I haven't read enough at the source to tell. I mean, many people will argue that it was Alexander Hamilton. Uh, I'm not in a position to argue against that. I know others would argue against that claim, too. Uh, some claim infinite economic growth is a fantasy, and the field of economics needs to be reconceived along a long-term steady state. Uh, nonsense is my thought of that, complete nonsense. There's no reason why economy cannot grow forever. The myth of limited resources was blown up by uh, Julian Simon, the great economist. Uh, human needs are infinite. The human ability to create resources, to discover resources, to figure out resources. The human ability to do that is infinite. We should be mining asteroids and mining Mars and mining the moon. There's, the Earth is not our limit. But there is no limited resources in any meaningful way. So there is no reason to imagine economic growth being capped in some way. There's no limit to how much we as individuals need. We discover we need stuff after the producers produce it for us. And then we can't live without it. iPhones is a good example of that. But we're just starting. We've had economic growth for 200 years, 250 years. I mean, just think of what is possible in another 500 years. I mean, you'd have to be a science fiction writer to imagine it. But we've just started figuring out what computers can do. We've just started figuring out what robots can do. We've just started figuring out all these, you know, the, human, the full human potential and the potential of innovation. I mean, and as we combine human brain power with computers, wow, what will our needs be then? So no, there's no limit to economic growth because there's no limit to resources, because there's no limit to the human imagination. There's no limit to human needs. There's no limit to what we can produce. Um, all right, we've got some interesting super chat questions that might require whole shows. Uh, okay, so that was uh, economic. Let's see if there are any economic questions. Um, why do so many smart people believe we need more inflation? 
many talking heads were saying the opposite 10 years ago. I mean, <laughs> I don't know why so many people, smart or otherwise, think we need inflation. It is nuts. Because they associate inflation with economic growth. There is this myth that economic growth produces inflation, but economic growth produces the opposite. It produces deflation, not credit deflation, which is a collapse of credit, but price deflation. When economic growth is really high, for example, look at economic growth, look at productivity increases in computers. That has resulted, that has resulted in the price of computing going down every single year. It's resulted in deflation. You buy a computer today for two thousand dollars. It's what? It's got the power of a computer that would have cost you a million dollars ten, fifteen years ago. So productivity increases tend to cause deflation, and it's interesting because those areas in the economy that have massive price inflation have massive increases in cost. Healthcare, education, real estate are the ones in which government is involved the most. And if you free those sectors up, privatize them, deregulated them, then what you would have is more deflation. In almost every sector where the private sector dominates, prices have come down, not up. So this obsession with 2% inflation targeting or whatever is completely nonsensical. And, you know, it's derived from Keynesian models of the economy that are very sophisticated and very complex and very, and, and are the exact kind of models that have led us to the, the crash in 2008 and the Great Recession and, and, and the stagnation that we experience today. What we need is to get over all of that. What we need is a return to objective money. And objective money is probably gold, but you'd let the market determine that. The market has determined it in the past and will probably determine that in the future. And what you need is private banking, competition for currencies, which I think gold would win that competition and would actually have a global currency. And I know globalists out there you don't like globalists. Well, we'd have a global currency, which is called gold. And that's really a one currency world. I know, that's globalist speak. But that's the ideal. Um, but people are enamored with government, with its ability to print money, to control money. They're enamored with the power that that gives, us over, or gives them over our lives. They're enamored with the idea that only government can do this. And, you know, it, it gives them immense, immense power. You know, it's, it's stunning to me how really, 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 really smart people are so utterly stupid. It's one of the reasons... I don't like the whole IQ thing because I know so many people with unbelievably high IQ that cannot think. Cannot think. They've got the horsepower. They can do the math. They can't think. They can't integrate. And therefore, they're destructive. They're not productive. And, and, and I count m most economists or many economists, many academic economists, if not most of them, on the destructive side, because they cannot think. They cannot integrate. And the consequences are this, this, this the, 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 they can't think outside of a box, so they have a Federal Reserve. So now, okay, what should the Federal Reserve do? Well, it should target something. So you can come up with equations, you can come up with a number, you can come up with all kinds of things instead of saying, well, why, do we have a, why should we have a Fed? Why can't we let markets do this? All right, uh, what is the business cycle? A business cycle is just the idea that you have expansion and then you have contraction. 
you have economic growth, then you have a recession, then you have economic growth, then a recession. So you have these cycles. And, the, and it's a business cycle because it's about business activity. During expansion, you have expansive business activity. You have economic growth. You have businesses growing. During contraction, businesses contract. And the idea is that there's this business cycle. And one of the, the next question is, can you explain the differences between the Austrian and Chicago school? One of the differences between the two is the explanation for the business cycle. The Austrians believe the business cycle is driven by primarily by Federal Reserve policy, by monetary policy, by inflation, not the kind of inflation people talk about today, price inflation, but real inflation, which is the printing of money. The printing of money. So, um, that is what, um, that is, and they, the Chicago school doesn't believe that. They believe that the market basically knows what the Fed is doing, can predict what the Fed is going to do, and basically neutralizes what the Fed is going to do. It's called rational expectations. So they can rationally predict the Fed's movements and therefore nullify them. And some in the Chicago school actually believe that the Fed is irrelevant in that sense. It cannot have a real impact on the real economy. Um, Chicago school is quite mathematical, model-driven, uh, believes in a Fed, at least most of the Chicago school believes there should be a Fed. Uh, Milton Friedman was part of the Chicago school most of his life. He was a very academic economist. He was, uh, built models, did math, did empirical studies, uh, uh, and, and versus Austrians who don't believe in, don't believe in math and economics, who, uh, it's like Mises and Hayek. They, they, they explain the economics in terms of, you know, verbal explanations, logical explanations. They use reason to explain the economy without the use of math. Now, I think some math is useful. I think empirical studies are useful. I, I, I think the Austrians, some Austrians go too far in dismissing mathematics and empirical studies. But I think generally Austrians have it right. Um, I, I do think markets can be fooled. I think it's a mistake to assume markets cannot be fooled, that they always predict, that they always get it, that they always anticipate. Um, those are some of the differences. They're generally free market, both schools. Austrian tends to be more free market than the Chicago school, as illustrated by the fact that Chicago thinks, uh, most Chicago economists believe there should be a Federal Reserve, there should be central banking, the, the, the Austrians do not. All right, I think that is all the questions I have um, on economics. So I'm going to go down the questions. Um, just in order. A lot of odd questions, which is great. What is your favorite Shakespeare play and why? I mean, that's a tough one because I, I, I love a lot of Shakespeare. I think Romeo and Juliet is a stunning, amazing play with, with, with so many interesting ideas in it um, about love and about tribalism and, and, uh, and, and the evil of tribalism and the consequences of tribalism. Um, I, I, I love Macbeth, the consequences of evil. And, and it, I mean, Shakespeare is such a good psychologist. He understands the psychology of evil. He understands kind of the rationalizations of evil, the need to rationalize. The, 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 the Macbeth and Lady Macbeth's constant need to rationalize their actions, to explain it to themselves, to justify it to themselves and to each others. Just masterful in terms of the, 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 what evil does to you. I mean, the scene where she's trying to wash the blood off of her hands, right? And it's not really, the blood is not really there. It's psychological. It, it, evil destroys you. It destroys your capacity for joy. It destroys your capacity for happiness. It destroys your capacity to think. Um, I love, uh, for, 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 I, I love The Merchant of Venice. It's not, I don't think, aesthetically one of his greatest plays. But I love The Merchant of Venice. It, it's so, it's so clever. It's so smart in terms of its uh, understanding of, of uh, usury and, and it's, you know, it's explicit uh, anti-Semitism, but, but in, in a 
in a clever kind of way, you know, but it's illustrative of, of a whole line of, of, of the way people thought about the world in those days and the drama that that involves. And it's, a, it's, it's an amazing play. Um, then my favorite, you know, and you could go on and on. I mean, uh, uh, the very few plays of Shakespeare I don't like. But my favorite, my favorite is Othello. Um, because it's so well done. It's so dramatic. It's so striking. The evil is the most evil, maybe outside of Ellsworth Tui, one would ever see in a drama. Yago has no motivation other than the destruction for the sake of destruction of Othello. Because Othello is a good guy. Because Othello is a good guy. And it's so tragic, and it's so sad, and it's so powerful. And, you know, it shows you, again, the psychology of how good people can be manipulated by bad people. How good can be manipulated by evil. I mean, the problem philosophically with the play is it, it gives evil too much credit, too much, it's too efficacious. But it also shows the weakness of the good in this case. How easy it is to manipulate, what envy, what jealousy, what distrust will do. I, I've seen the movies of Othello, I've seen it on stage. It is truly a, a magnificent play and uh, I think probably Shakespeare's best. I'm not an expert. My favorite, not his best, I shouldn't say his best because I'm not an expert. My favorite, probably. But, but I, like, I like all of those plays. I, I like some of the comedies. Um, um, what's the one? Taming of the Shrew. I mean, if you've ever seen the movie Taming of the Shrew, with, uh, if you haven't seen that, you should definitely with, with um, uh, what's his name? Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It, that is such a fun movie. I mean, the acting is so brilliant. Uh, so look at Richard, uh, 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 Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor, Taming of the Shrew. It, it's, it, really is, it really is fantastic. I, you know, I, I haven't seen as much Shakespeare as I'd like to. Generally, I haven't seen as many plays as I'd like to. Midsummer Night's Dream is, is hilarious and clever. A lot of them are. A lot of, the, uh, a, a lot of them, I, you know, I'm not going to tell you, uh, you know, I, I don't know of a Shakespeare play I, I don't like. I mean, some of them are a little more difficult. I mean, I like Henry V. I like his historic, the history plays where he tells the history of kind of the British monarchy. I think all of those are really good. Um, so there's a lot. There's a lot. All right. Um, favorite romantic hero novels that you have read? Well, my favorite are, are Hugo. 83... Uh, 83 or 93? 93. Um, Les Miserables, The Man Who Laughs, Toilers of the Sea. Those are the most heroic, best novels ever. I also like a, a book called Ivanhoe. Uh, so I like a lot of the kind of the 19th century French and English romantic writers. There's a lot of them. Uh, Scaramouche, Scaramouche, I think his name is. I forget the author's name. There's a lot of good 19th century romantic uh, literature that is very enjoyable. Again, I'm not an expert on romantic literature. Have you seen The Witcher on Netflix? I have not. I've, I've just downloaded a few episodes onto my iPad to watch while I travel. Uh, let's see. In Zurich, there is a show of Atlas Shrugged, a satire. I haven't heard of that. I, I, I'd appreciate if you would send me some information about that, a, a musical satire of Atlas Shrugged in Zurich. If somebody can send me a, um, you know, a, a uh, link to that, I would love to see it. I mean, I think it's horrible, but I'd, I'd like to see what they're doing. Did you at some point help your children to develop a higher care values 
Do you ever challenge them in this regard? I mean, probably not, and I probably should have. I probably should have. You know, it's one of those things that I, I probably could have done more to help my kids develop hierarchy of values. Anyway, I'm, I, um, you say soldiers of authoritarian armies aren't motivated, but weren't the Nazis some of the most motivated and efficient fighting forces in the world? No, not particularly, not particularly. Um, I think there's a small cadre of people who you can brainwash for a while into being highly motivated and, and brainwash, I don't mean in a technical sense. You can convince to be motivated around a cause for a while, but at some point that motivation dries up because at some point it doesn't add up and it doesn't integrate into anything. I, I don't think of the Nazis as particularly motivated soldiers. I, I mean, I, I think they lost the war primarily because of strategic errors made by the Nazi high command, but that was inevitable. But I also think they would have lost the war anyway because I don't think they are capable of fighting as well as a free army. So, no, I mean, if you think about, you know, in a sense, how easily Patton destroyed the German army once uh, American forces and, and Allied forces landed on Normandy and, and once Patton was unleashed on Europe, how quickly, how quickly... And, and, uh, and, and I think if he, if he had been left free even more, it would have been even faster they destroyed the German army. So I don't particularly think the Nazis were a motivated and efficient, efficient fighting force. They might have been initially when, when they thought, oh, we're going to win and this is going to be easy and we're going to crush everybody. But once they got resistance, once they saw resistance on the Russian front, once they saw resistance on the, on the Western front, and, and, but, but, but just think of how much resistance they got with Russia. And Russia had pathetic weapons, no motivation. They were communists, so they were less motivated than the Nazis. And yet the Nazis couldn't defeat them. I mean, weather didn't help. Lots of other things didn't help. But Nazis are not this amazing fighting force as they're projected. Not at all. Do you like Alma Deutsch? Yeah, I like Alma Deutsch. I mean, she's a child. So there's only so much sophistication you can get out of her music. But she's talented and she's worth supporting and enjoyable. The music is enjoyable just as, uh, you know, young Mozart's music was enjoyable. And, and I, not that I'm comparing her talent to his. I, I, I don't know how, wouldn't know how to. But um, she's obviously talented and obviously oriented towards classical music, which is good and trying to write sophisticated, uh, uh, important music. And we'll see how far she gets. I hope, I hope she does very, very well. All right, uh, let's see. Um, I wonder how primitive man still is intellectual in general knowledge, science, thought. I don't understand the question. I wonder how primitive man still is intellectually, is intellectually in general knowledge, science. I don't understand the question, sorry. Um, do movies like Avatar discourage economic growth? Yeah. To the extent that they tell people that economic growth is evil, to the extent that they tell young people in particular that mankind is evil, that we should go back and live in caves, live with the, with the plants, live in the forest, don't try to be civilized, don't try to, to progress, then yes, I think it has an impact on motivation, it has an impact on culture, and it has an impact on legitimizing the anti-life, anti-man environmentalist movement. Star Trek, the original series on Next Generation. I mean, I'm biased here because uh, for a variety of reasons in terms of when I was watching TV and wh when I grew up and all of that, I, you know, Star Trek, the original series, is, is part of my youth and, and Next Generation was not. I wasn't watching television when Next Generation was on, so I watched very little of Next Generation. So I'm definitely an original series guy. And, and I, I think the original series is very clever, very smart, very intellectual, always ideas-driven, and I'm a big fan. Um, and it, it, I've been told that The Next Generation is too. I've been told that, like, there's other parts of the Star Trek universe that are even better than the original one in terms of intellectual and ideas and, and being smart and everything. I, I just not, have not experienced it directly. 
If no Federal Reserve, what would have been the best way to stop bank runs? Well, you have to ask why there are bank runs. I mean, uh, the Federal Reserve in and of itself did not stop bank runs. There were bank runs in the 1920s while there was a Federal Reserve. There was, there was uh, bank runs in 1932, massive bank runs in 1932 when the, when the Federal Reserve was very involved. What stopped bank runs was not the Federal Reserve, but was deposit insurance. Was the government guarantee that your insurance would be safe no matter what happens? And I think that's perverse as well. So I don't think, in a sense, anything should stop bank runs. I think the marketplace, I think bank runs are good discipline against bad banking. Bank runs, uh, uh, you know, the only thing that should um, stop bank runs, if you will, is deposit insurance that's privately guaranteed, privately priced, privately insured and therefore adjust the insurance rates based on the riskiness of the bank, which encourages banks to keep more reserve and therefore be less susceptible to bank runs. So, I mean, we don't have time now to get into the intricacies of bank runs and deposit insurance and all that, but the market solves these problems much better than a Federal Reserve or, or government does. And if you're interested, there's a lot of literature on free banking. There's a lot of literature on why the Federal Reserve is bad. Uh, George Selgin and Larry White are, are, are some of the top economists when it comes to free banking, when it comes to getting rid of the Federal Reserve, when it comes to, to defending fractional reserve uh, banking. And, and that goes to the, can you teach Bert Meister why fractional reserve banking is good, okay? I've tried before, I think, with Bert Meister. I, I don't think this is the first time it's come up. But no, I, I don't think today is the time or the place to do it. I'm happy to do a show on fractional reserve banking uh, if, if there's real demand for that. But um, I think um, people have heard me and I've, I referenced, I refer you to good content on this topic. Uh, Larry White, George Selgin uh, on, on uh, fractional reserve banking, on free banking, I think they're the best resources for this. Um, if, uh, okay, so that's if no Federal Reserve, what else do we have here? Why aren't prices rising given all the QE? Well, because the QE is not going into consumption, which is what would drive prices up. QE is going into basically two places. It went into bank reserves at the Federal Reserve, so it went back into the Fed, it was distributed by the Fed and then sucked back into the Fed uh, by the Federal Reserve through, uh, what do you call it, through um, uh, required reserve, not required reserves, through the fact that the Federal Reserve pays interest on reserves and an increase in reserve requirements by, by uh, Dodd-Frank. And the second place that the money's going in is because it's flowing through financial institutions, it's going towards increasing financial asset valuations. So where it looks like we're seeing inflation, if you will, increasing prices, price inflation, is in financial assets. The stock market, certainly the bond market, low interest rates, and, and, and potentially real estate. Hard to tell, but potentially real estate. So there is, prices are going up in certain sectors of the economy. Not in all sectors. Those sectors that touch QE are going up. Those sectors that don't touch QE, consumption, goods, you don't see inflation going up. You don't see prices going up. But most of that money, if you look at the amount of money flowing in and then the amount of money going into reserves, most of the money flowing in through QE went into reserves. What's the best way to achieve your values when feeling down? Well, it's to, I mean, the best way, I think, to stop feeling down is to achieve your values. So the, I think the best way when you're feeling down is to go and do something. Don't let yourself be mired in the down. Don't let, let the down hold you back. Act. It, it requires a, an act of massive will to overcome the feeling down and to go out there and act in reality and achieve at the same time, if there are real problems that are leading you to feel down, then I think you need to go think about what those problems are. And if necessary, go see a psychologist. Go see somebody who can help you 
figure out the things that are keeping you down so that to free you from that down feeling so that you can push ahead. So if it's a real bad situation, a chronic situation, a situation where you cannot find the will to overcome, then you need to see a psychologist. But sometimes you just have a down day and I'm feeling down, don't feel like getting up. I, you know, I told my wife before the show, I said, I don't feel like getting up from the chair. I don't feel like doing this. I just want to sit here. And like the only way to overcome that was to just get up off the chair to come into this room and to do it. And now I feel much better. And by the time I go back to the chair, <laughs> I'm going to be full of energy. And, and the, the, the down is, is gone. Right? It depends on what's causing the down, right? It depends on what's slowing you down. All right. Sorry for the technical error in the middle. I'm, I'm glad we got to uh, pick up where we left off. Uh, I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover. I got to all of your um, Super Chat questions. Uh, remember to like the show. Uh, and if you like it, remember to share the show. And if you like my shows more broadly, remember to support the show. And you can do that by um, by supporting the show financially on youronbookshow.com slash support. Um, I will be traveling uh, for the next month in and out of here, but generally on the road. I will try to do some shows on the road. We'll see how the technology holds up there. I will definitely do shows when I'm back here, but that won't be very often. And um, some of you, some of you, I will actually see on the road, particularly if you're in Europe, I hope all of you in Europe are coming to our Warsaw Conference. I hope those of you in California are coming to either the Orange County Conference or the San Francisco co Conference. I'm always excited to personally meet you guys, the listeners to this show. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.